This is the last, no matter what happens, this is the last talk that we're going to do on this. And, and, but I think we can get through it. Um, all right. You guys ready? You ready? So you're going to yell at me. <laughs> I need to find you. I'm going to be looking at you going on and saying anything wrong. I think I understand this paper a little bit better now, though. I have a better sense of it. And I have a plan, actually, for this chalk talk. We're going to start out as sort of a review with the overall process. And at the top of the paper, or near the top of the paper, they have a, uh, a pipeline of our system. And I thought, you know what? You should write this down right at the top because it's skinny and it would fit and you could keep it up there. So the very first thing that they do, well, first of all, remember what we're trying to do because uh, last time, uh, using some training data, we're going to build a model of a person's face. Then that person will sit down in front of a, a video camera, a single camera, no depth sensor whatsoever, and we're going to try to figure out the pose of that person's face and that person's expression in real time. There is some aspect of it that is uh, machine learning. There's a lot of stuff that's also computer vision. And we're gonna, last time we talked about how we build a model of the person's face. So we're going to really quickly just talk about, we're going to skip most of that. But this is the overall pipeline. So first of all, um, uh, this is, let's do pre-process. So we're going to start out with drawings like this, where a whole bunch of images, single static images. This is not a video, actually. We have um, our person in various poses. And positions in the world. So there, there can be head rotation and stuff. And we talked a bit, little bit about this. There's typically around 75 poses of the person moving their head and making expressions and stuff. This is, this is number one. We do this. Um, and these guys have, this gets sent through DLib and editing and kind of small there to have to add labels. So this adds labels to landmarks. All right. So remember that we were talking about this. Uh, there's there's a certain number of points on the face. And again, somebody who's got the paper with you, tell me the exact number, but it's. On the order of around 60 points on the face, or a little bit more, where the corners of the eyes are labeled, the tip of the nose, uh, various various features on this thing are labeled. So we have that we have that in our pocket. This is something that we get created in using either DLib in order to do the automatic labeling and then editing to make sure it's right. We have this and know that that is something we can rely on. From this, we build training data. And um, what this is, is uh, um, training images and shapes. So let's do this. We have an image, there's a person, and for that, we have that little sort of mask of a person. Um, for each one of these poses and expressions. So we know exactly where the, the landmarks are, where the features are, and the shapes of this. And this also corresponds to uh, user-specific blend shapes. So again, I'm going to draw a picture, but this is a, a 3D mesh. So this is a 3D mesh point of user specific blend shapes. What are the things underneath the images? You have the, in the upper box, you have the image and then the little face. 
So these are the images, yeah. these are the labeled landmarks, and then okay. this is user specific oh, okay. lens shapes, which we then have basically a rig from those. Okay. Right? And this is where we stopped last time. So we've, we've built our sort of data set that we can use to create. So again, we have all these images, we have this, we have the landmarks in this bottom, but the top one up here is training images and shapes. So we have this training image that corresponds to a 2D and 3D location of points that represent those landmarks on the face. Also from this, we built a set of blend shapes, and this is our standard blend shape model. Right? Uh, e equals B0 plus, uh, they have 46 blend shapes in this thing, from one to that, and we have alpha E5, right? So they're basically saying that any expression that this user can do, we can create with our standard blend shape, and this is user-specific blend shape, so using face warehouse, we were able to take these 75 different images, figure out their location, and then use it to pull the blend shapes out of Face Warehouse so that this thing actually looks a lot like the user. It's not perfect, but it looks really, really close to the user. All right? Okay, so far so good. This is what we talked about last time. And so that, that's all we're gonna do. Where magic happens and this happens. So now, we're going to do something. We're going to build, and we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about this. We need a 3D shape regressor. And then we need a user specific. Shape regress or three D shape regression. And we this is what we're going to talk about today. What this is saying is okay, now that we have this, we have these images, we have this this representation of the person's face. We have to go back and say, all right, now this user is going to be sitting in front of the camera, and we're going to get image after image after image. And we have to very rapidly come up with a way of figuring out where that user's head is in the image, and also how that user's head is oriented in space, and also what the user's expression is. Now the one thing that we don't have to do in this case is figure out what the user looks like. The, the whole thing in this particular paper is that we have a model of the user, and the user is gonna be sitting in front of the, image, or the camera, and we don't have to decide that this isn't that user. There are following papers where this works for arbitrary people, but for this paper, we have this neat thing that we know how the user looks and moves. Is there something that we could build that looks at an image and then rapidly figures out where the user is in the image and uh, how they, what the expression that they is on the user's face? Oh, that's going to be cool. So that's the next thing. I'm going to actually draw this in green because we're going to erase it. But uh, this is this is the eventual pipeline. So this is an image of the user coming from a web camera, right? So there's a web camera. This goes into the user specific, and let me just go back, um, 3D shape regressor that we built. That top row is we're building it. That, now we're actually using it. And this thing comes along, takes the input, this image, combos it together, we do this regression, and out pops, I'm just copying the whole thing, so this is this is the shape regressor, and this is actually doing the regression. Regression. I remember regression is just basically computing, it's figuring out what the, rapidly figuring out this thing. And so what we get out of this is a picture of the user, here's the picture of the user, with the mesh sitting on top of it, with that. 3D shape sitting on there. So we know where the location of the features are. We have this all kind of neat little thing. And, and there's that sort of Batman mesh that uh, goes along here so that we know how the, the feature is oriented and we know the outline of the lips and all sorts of stuff. 
So we have that. But we're not even done. That then goes into oops, wrong color. User specific blend shapes. So we use the blend shapes. And this was one of the key things that I didn't get at the very beginning. Tracking to get a oops, wrong thing. A 3D model, and then we've got this thing. This is an actual polygonal model. Polygon in there to show you that this is a polygon model, which is the tracked mesh. Tracked mask or mesh. And this is the thing that I the, 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 was, was sort of key in this thing to me is that there are two separate representations of the user space. First of all, there are these images and those 3D locations of the face, features on the face, right? And there's something like 60 features on the face, or there are plus or minus something like that. So it's actually a fairly low resolution thing. That's the thing we're going to try to figure out first. But then we want to take this into an entire, um, a higher level, right? So we want to take this into an animated blend shape rig. So there's a step here where we're taking the low resolution location of this mask and upresing it, and basically saying, if I know this mask, what would this, um, um, what do they call that? They call that the training images and shapes. So training shapes, let's say. If I know how this training shape is sitting on this person's face, can I then solve for the blend shape weights that give me a really nice tracked mesh that looks like the user? Because this does not look like the user. I mean, it's the location of the points on the face, but it looks like this Batman mask. We want something that actually is a 3D mesh that looks like the user. And then, once we do that, we can take the blend shape rings that you were used to create this and translate it out into a character that we bring that uses the same kind of blend shape rings. And you get animated, real-time avatar kind of crap going on. So that's a key point. There's low res and high res. This is 3D locations. This is blend shape weights. And there are two separate solves. The first thing we're going to do is figure out where this low res training mesh fits on this guy's face. Then we're going to solve for that one, the blend shape. Makes sense? Got it? Right? Hey, John. Okay. So, this is pretty cool. The cool thing is, and the, the, one of the really cool things, is this sucker runs wicked fast. This is a, we're going to be using a boosted regression tree, or, or a boosted regressor, which actually is a boosted decision uh, for us. And it's a two-stage boosted decision for us, and that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about today. This sucker runs fast. That produces a 3D location of the mesh, and then the blend shape is not actually all that hard. You're basically looking at this going, hey, wait, 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 wait. I know how my blend shapes work. I know how the landmark points on my blend shapes fit. I basically just have to solve for alphas so that the, my blend shape thing fits that mask as well as possible. So that's not the super hard thing. This is the interesting thing. Can we get this to run fast? So that's what we're going to talk about now. Leave this up here. We're going to go into the paper. So first of all, we're going to stop right off the bat and talk a little bit about face alignment with explicit shape regression. So I, I, I put a link in uh, the uh, Chalk Talk announcement, but I'm going to write it down just because if you look at this later, you may not even notice that link. So it's called Face Alignment by Explicit Shape Regression. So, this thing is a paper that came out in 2012 by a different cow. This is uh, Chen Cao who um, is doing this, this paper that we're dealing with. This, this is by Zudong Cao uh, from Microsoft Research Asia. And we've covered this. We covered this paper like three years ago. 
and on its own chalk talk. We've talked about this paper. I, I went back to my chalk talk list, and I noticed that this paper is referenced like in three different chalk talks on facial tracking because it really was sort of the foundation for a lot of real time stuff. And in fact, DLib, I wrote this down. DLib is a little library that you can go and download. It's not a little library, it's a big library of all sorts of computer vision y kind of things. This is that. The DLib's implementation is very similar to it. It's basically based on this paper. So that, you're like, well, wait a sec, we're already using this. And, and this paper here is, is definitely using this. But the interesting thing is, this is a 2D solution. It is basically figuring out the 2D location of these points in the image. We want our landmarks to be 3D. That's one of the key ads of this paper is he takes DLib's uh, algorithm and boosts it. So, speaking of boosting, what is boosting? Well, we're gonna go over this paper in 10 minutes, five minutes, if, if not fast. We're gonna go really quickly over it. So the whole idea is, so, in this paper, we have a face shape. Piece is represented by S. All right, and S is a big long vector of x1, y1, x2, y2, all the way to xn, yn of 2D pixel locations. So the face shape in this paper are the landmarks that we're tracking on our face. And that's like the corners of the eyes, the tip of the nose, the things I've listed before, the 60 things that we want to try to find in the shape. And the shape in this paper is all just 2D locations. Again. And what we basically have, is the, the, in, given a face image, given an image of a face, we want to do this. So here's our face, here's We want to find Given the image of a face, the goal of face alignment is to estimate the shape S that is as close to possible as the true shape S prime. So we want to find S that is as close to possible as S prime, which is the true shape of the face in the image. Now you look at this, and especially when I first read this, I was looking at that equation going, well, that is just nonsense. Because we're trying to figure out the shape of the face that gets closest of all to the true shape of the face. We don't know the true shape of the face. That's the thing we're looking for. This is just like saying, that's a, a tautologist. We can't even, we want to find the thing that is the thing. Oh, well, we can't find it because we don't know it. And in fact, that's what they say. This would be great to solve if only we knew this. But then the machine learning guys go, well, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. Wait, what if we train this with a whole bunch of shapes that we do know this? What if we build something that, even though we don't know it for this individual image, we've given it enough of the true shapes that we can come up with a way of figuring out this true shape or getting close to the true shape without even knowing the true shape, which is mind blowing that this actually works. So what we're going to do in this, skip that because that's all goofy. What we're going to try to do is come up with a way of learning from a whole bunch of examples. Um, so they had, in this paper, they had a bunch of grad students label a whole bunch of images. And I'm trying to remember exactly how many, but it doesn't matter. And the goal of this is to do this thing called boosted regression. The idea behind boosted regression is that I'm going to start this sucker off with a shape. I'm going to start it out with a, a shape zero, which is basically the most generic shape that I could possibly find. I just have, like if I had a blank image, I'm going to put in there the shape where I expect the eyes and the tip of the nose and the mouth and this is going to, and there's the outline of the thing, and that is the 
shape of my face that it, if I can't see a face, that's the face that I assume it's going to be. And this is my default, you know, starting point for any shape, uh, face searching. But what I want is I want to build something that looks at this, looks at the image that I'm actually getting, and adjusts these points so that they're actually closer to the, the image that I'm looking at. And they, I start deforming these guys. I'm going to start subtly changing that default shape into the shape of the face in the current image. And so we're going to write down a little equation. It's not that crazy of an equation. It's actually kind of cool. We're going to say, all right, well, let's assume that we have the shape after a certain period of searching. And I want to find this thing called R, which is my regressor. That's my amazing black box for the current time that takes the current image and the previous shape, and this produces a shape minus T. All right. So this is where the boosting of regression uh, comes in, is that figuring out an R, that just looking at an image produces the right shape is really impossible. It's really hard. But figuring out an R that takes a current guess at the shape the image, and then nudges the shape so that it's closer to the right shape. It's actually, oops, all right, I did T minus one, that's T. I've got all my indices one, T minus one, that's T. So we've changed the problem to say, let's say, you know, we have an idea of where the shape is. We're going to take where it is and adjust it just a little bit. We're going to produce a delta shape here and then add it to our current shape and hopefully the new shape is actually going to be a little bit better. And we're going to do this over and over and over again. We're going to, this, this T actually goes to uh, 500. No, uh, no, 10. So I'm sorry, 10. There's going to be another number in here where there's 500. So we're going to do this 10 times. And each time we do this, the shape that we start out with actually is getting closer and closer and closer to the actual shape of the image. And I'm really going, all right, all right, that's kind of, that's cool, but how in the hell is it doing this? This is kind of weird. And what we're going to do is use a whole bunch of example shapes to build this thing. All right, sounds good, sounds good. Uh, really sounds really good. In fact, the way to write this down I can't do a chalk type without using hard min somewhere in there. So we're going to build an RT that equals hard min of RT of R actually for all our training shapes. I equals one to n, oops, n, where this is the number of training number of training images. that when you look at the correct result, which we know, this is the because this is a training uh, thing. Oops, and that's not Oops. And taking what was previously known plus R, oops, um, I, S sub I, uh, T minus one. So, what does it say? What does it say? For each one of these things, remember the 10 of them that we're going to run one after the other, one after the other, we're going to say, I want to look at all my training images. And for each one of the training images, I've got the shape that the previous regressor found and the current image. I want a regressor that is really good at taking the shape that the previous regressor found and nudging it closer to the final solution. And in fact, I want to find this thing that, so here's our final solution. I want to get as close as possible to that final solution. And it turns out when you run this thing, the first regressors do this gross motion. They basically turn the head without adjusting the big shape at all and because of the way they build this thing. So that the first regressors actually just sort of try to figure out what is going on in the image. And then as you get farther and farther up that recursion, 
that regressor number eight, nine, and ten are actually doing minute changes to snap the, the thing in there. They stop changing the overall motion of this sh uh, shape, and they start adjusting little teeny tiny, uh, tiny things because they're getting closer and closer. And you can really think about that. If I have my generic shape that I start with, and I want to find this guy in the thing, the first thing I need to do is just sort of slam this guy, this shape over until it fits the face. But once I've fit the face, I'm going to start moving these points individually, not changing everything, because I still want it to be a, shape, a face shape, and I'm going to get closer and closer to the guy's expression. All right, so we're going to do that. How do we do that? This is where the cool thing is. This is actually a two-stage regression. Each one of those little R's, we can get rid of this, you know it's all pixels now, right? Each one of those little R's is actually built up of a billion, or a lot, of primitive regressors. So each one of those R's, uh, R sub T is equal to R1, R2, dot, 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 R, K, all the way up to R, and this is big K. Sort of annoying when you're writing down on uh, chalkboard. We propose to learn each weak regressor RT, the, this guy, he's called a weak regressor, with an even weaker regressor with, by a second level boosted regression. We're going to have a whole bunch of these little teeny guys that are really good at moving just individual parts of this thing. All right, so I'm not going to go into much more detail on that because I don't want to spend too much time in this. But the whole idea is that these guys are going to look at moving individual features in our mask, in the, that original face shape. And the way they're going to do it is by looking at the difference between two pixels. Okay. How do you find the difference of those two pixels? Well, well, this, this becomes this huge randomized search. We're going to be looking for the current state of our search, because remember, this is based on where the face shape is in our current image and how it's gotten to. We're going to look for two pixels that are randomly chosen that just happen to nudge the feature in the shape the right way. And there's a whole way of putting this together. And this is where a lot of the expense of this algorithm is, is trying to figure out the right pixels. But they're, we're basically going to take a whole bunch of random samplings of pixels and look for the difference between just two of those pixels that correlate really well to moving one part of the shape in the right direction. And we're going to write that down. We're going to say, hey, I've noticed that when we're in a certain state, and the, shape, the face is in this, and we have this image, the difference between the color of this pixel and the color of that pixel correlates really well with a motion of that. We're just going to adjust it just a little bit. And remember, these are very small adjustments. And we're going to do it again. We're going to choose another two pixels, another feature, and we're going to figure out two pixel difference. And you're like, does this work? How can this possibly work? It actually does because the numbers in here are very, very large. We're doing this a lot. And so we're going to try to find two pixels that happen to nudge the, the part of the shape in the right direction. We're going to do it over and over and over again. We're going to build this whole list of pixel pairs and shape parts that get nudged correctly for this one specific time in the search for the shape. So initially, you can kind of think of this as like, okay, well, wait, what? How's this rank? Remember what we were talking about? We have uh, maybe our face is over here and it's looking in this direction. And we start out with a, a generic shape case, and, and we don't uh, shape image. And typically, we use the previous frame, but for now, you can just sort of say, we've got points that are sort of in the middle of the image. Here's our shape and our face. And it's that. And we happen to notice that the difference between this pixel and the background image corresponds really well to moving this image. You know, these, these pixels are going to be widely spaced apart because we're basically searching for a face like thing within this uh, range. And I'm, I'm simplifying a lot because a lot of this is happening at the same time. 
So this thing is going to find these differences going, hey, you know, I've seen other pictures like this. When I see that kind of configuration with a whole bunch of really <laughs> pixel differences, it's really good to move the, the, the shape in this direction. And remember, we're only doing that once. It's just a little change, and then we do it again. We have all those little RTs in there that are going to be moving this thing based on pixel differences. It actually works. It takes a while to train. It takes a long time and a lot of images in order to get this thing to behave correctly. But the cool thing is, once you've done this, executing all those Rs, the R0 goes to the R1, goes to the R all the way up to R10, and each one of these guys has R1, R2, all the way up to R500. And each one of these guys has R1. And so you can see a lot of things are happening along this way. There's another R2 all the way up to R500 here. Each one of these guys can be run in parallel. And so this whole thing can run really quickly because the only thing they're doing is looking at pixel differences. This, well, this thing is looking at the results of this, but these guys are all just looking at the difference between two pixels in the image. How does this happen? Because you, know, you don't know what the background is going to be, blah, blah, blah. That's okay. We've trained this with enough things that the right things are going to start getting triggered. And it eventually is going to get to a point where it doesn't matter what the background is. The shape has been found. Now we're just looking at the difference between the, the color of the inside of the eye and the outside of the nose, and the color of the lip versus the, the color of the chin. And so now it's all face specific. It doesn't matter that you know some people have lighter skin than darker skin. Well, no, not really, because we're looking at the difference between the pixels. So we're looking at basically, is this thing brighter or darker than that? It actually works. Yes. So the, 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 this blows me away too. And this kind of thing has come up in previous draw talks as well. And we were equally astonished. Maybe someday it will come up and we're like, oh yeah. Yeah. But um, they were talking about like maybe ratio of pixels instead of difference of pixels. So it's invariant to how much light's in the scene or whether you're 0 to 1 or 0 to 255 or anything. They seem to be working 0 to 255 a lot. So uh, <laughs> this is all 0 to 255. I think you can normalize it to 0 and 1. But it is just the difference of the pixels. So the negative versus the positive matter. And then the values are both negative and positive. It's not the absolute difference. OK, probably gamma correction doesn't matter, whatever. It's just a bit. You can't count on it. Then none of this stuff is being gamma corrected at all. The one key thing in this, though, and they, they spend a lot in both, both papers, there is the scale invariance. So if I've got an image of a person, and there's my person. And I've got a feature um, that I'm tracking, so the corner of the eye. Now I have two pixels that I'm looking at. And depending on what phase of this process that I'm looking at, these pixels might be you know, all the way across the image or close to the image. And also, I've drawn this person in this image, but the, the head could be a lot smaller if the person's farther away, or the head could be a lot bigger if the person is closer to the camera. So they have a, a way of representing the coordinates of the pixels that we're examining. Maybe we're looking at the difference between those two pixels are being represented local to the feature that we're actually tracking. And that locality includes scale of the uh, overall shape, face shape. So, if this has been nudged so that the images or the it's it's recognized that the face in the image is farther away, then we'll scale those pixel coordinates down because they want this to be relative to the actual feature that you're tracking. That they both papers talk about that a lot. The fact that this works blows me away. The fact that somebody thought about doing it this way just blows me away. That there, there are some really clever people out there. All right, so assume magic happens. Let's assume that this actually works, and it does. Uh, you can stop by my desk, and uh, DLib comes with a, a live version of this. And it just works. You just sit down, and it doesn't care what you look like. This DLib doesn't need a, an expression, um, and it'll just track your face. And it's really, it's quite good. It's not perfect by any means, but it's surprisingly good. So now. 
Rather than go into more details of how they did that, we're going to go back to this paper and talk about how they modified this, and you'll get more details along the way. So at the end of this, we have images that we've trained with. We have the face shapes that go along with those images, because we've discovered those. And we have a user-specific blend shape. So we're getting back to this paper. Now, step one is figuring out the pose of an individual image. So the first thing that we need to do, and I'm going to erase this because I need it. This is the title of that paper that we're not going to talk about. This reference. Here. So there's 3D facial uh, shape recovery. So this is where we kind of stop. Last. So the idea is, we're still thinking about this part right here. We're not actually running this. Don't think about this as running it live. We're still getting ready to do our shape progression. So at the end of last time, we have the features in, uh, that are perfectly identified for each training image that we got from there. And we built a 3D blend shape rig for our person that looks like the person. That's what the face warehouse stuff was. Now, there's a thing. We want to make sure that for an image in our training set, we know what the blend shape settings are. So for each of the labeled N setup images, 75 setup images, of the user with different head poses and facial expressions, we recover the corresponding 3D facial shape to use as a training data for the shape progressive. So this is we kind of lied a little bit here. With we have the 2D location. What we want to do is make this 3D. We want to figure out the, the 3D location of those points. So there's going to be a couple of things. We need to solve two things. We have to figure out M, which is the camera transform. of our, our rig into this thing. And we also have to figure out A, which is a big vector of our blend shapes. All the way down to N, right? So we have to do all of, do this. Oh, and uh, there's one other thing. The camera transform, and then there's Q, which is the uh, intrinsic coordinates. This is the projection features. So Q and M. Uh, which tell us how the camera, the, the Q is just a fixed thing because the same camera is being used to create all these uh, beta shapes. This is where the camera, the, the object, the face is inside uh, camera space. And that is the, the weights of our blend shape, right? So we're min minimizing, and I'm going to write this down to then quickly erase it. 1 through 75. So uh, oops, let's make sure I'm doing the right thing. This is an L. So given the expression blend shapes for a user and the camera projection matrix, which we solved before, the error between the 2D labeled landmark positions and the projection of the 3D landmark vertices is computed in the following way. Um, that, so this is for each facial landmark. So that L is for facial landmarks. This should use a different number. Let's change that to be 80. 75 facial landmarks, 80 training images. Because it gets confusing here. Um, all right, so we have that projects the 3D into the 2D. This transforms our blend shape model into camera space. And then this, one through, or let's see, i, i is equal to the blend shape, alpha i, beta i, um, uh, for the vertex L minus Q of L. That's great. All right, this isn't that hard, right? So this is basically, this thing here computes the shape of the face. So that's the face. This puts it into uh, camera space. 
<clears throat> and this projects it into a 2D image. And you know, and there's so if you're going to flowers here. And Q is the point of our feature that's been labeled in 2D. Which makes perfect sense, right? You're, you're figuring out how the face is shaped. We're putting it into a world space or a camera space, projecting it onto the screen, and comparing it with where we know that corner of the eye is going to be. And we do that for each one of these spatial landmarks. So this is basically saying, given the configuration, or given our landmarks that we know, we need to try to find the alphas and the M, or right? because so the Q was fixed and we figured it out before, that make this as small as possible. We want to get as close as possible to what we saw on our training images, right? This is all for training. All right, there was one other thing. There's a regularization. Regularization equals, and this is actually pretty cool. Okay. Star. I thought this was kind of clever. Since the setup images consist of predefined standard expressions, ha ha ha. So these guys are a list of 80 standard expressions that how we had the person do, right? Or not how we, no, Chen Kao. So Chen Kao said, okay, move your head like this, move down, move up, and make these kind of expressions. So we have default plane shape weights for each one of those expressions. So for this one, if I'm looking straight at the camera and I'm holding a neutral pose, the blend shape weights should mostly be my base blend shape, right? So all these guys should be zero. But if I've been told to smile and turn 30% to the camera, then I know that I should be in very close to a smile shape. So this was kind of clever. I thought it was kind of cool that, you know, since we're controlling our user, we can say, you know, when I'm solving for all these dudes, all the, you know, A is just this big list of these guys, I want to try to make sure that I don't stray too far from what I know this should be. This does not have to be zero, but we don't want to make a smile a frown. We don't want to say that that's not that. And so there's the whole balance of this is to try to figure out our man again, oh, we love our man, find the minimum value. What are we looking for? M, comma, A, and A is a big factor, and A that of, of E, sub t, how close are we to the actual expression we marked out in there, plus some regularization, weighted regularization, e sub regularization. So we have a little weighting function that is user settable. We can scroll this up and if we want to make sure that we don't stray too much, we make this big, and if we don't care, we'll set that low. And they said the, the w that they put to is 10. So this value, and the, the numbers are weird, you're just trying to balance this out, but they use 10 there in order to say, you know, we want to pay attention to regularization a lot, but we really want to minimize that. Alright, you can do that. We're going to do that, and they talk about ways of gradient descending and doing all sorts of stuff to do that, but assume that we can do that. Okay. Alright, so this whole process gives us the 3D in our 3D shapes. So far so good. All right, erase. So now we're ready. The very first thing to do before we start building that regression thingy that we're going to do, and quite frankly, the regression thingy that we're going to do is exactly one the same as that paper that I have listed out there, explicit blend shape or um, face align, or just push, putting it into 3D. So the very first thing we need is to make a lot of data. And the problem is, we only have 80 shapes. The thing with data, the, the, these label data, is that we, have, we need a lot of data in order to train this crazy-ass tree of R's. So that's not enough. That is definitely not enough. But 80 images to train our thing is not going to give us good results. We need a lot. Because remember, these are 80 images where the, Im the camera is right on the person's face and they're making exp explicit um, shapes. We want to be able to figure out, no matter where the person is, what they should look like. So they could be smaller, they could be off to the side, they could 
They could be pointed in an ob a, a weird direction. We want to be able to figure this out. So we're going to do some data augmentation. To achieve better generalization in representing face shapes, we augment the data of the captured images and their 3D face. So right now, we have pairs of I sub I, or I, that's lower I is the number of the, the image in our training data, and a shape sub I zero. We've got that. Or we know the 3D location of our landmark features, and we have an image that goes along with it. So step one is we're going to translate the 3D shape S0 along three camera coordinate axes. So the very first thing we're going to do is take our face shape and move it in various positions. So we've got the camera here. We're basically going to move it farther away from the camera. We're going to move it up and down. We're going to move it over and over there. So we're going to move it inside the camera space so that this thing is moving along. And we're going to do this multiple times, right? So we get M1 additional shapes. So now we get, for this one image, we have a set of S sub I J, where J goes from 2 less than J less than M. So now we have a set of different shapes that are basically located somewhere in camera space. And we start with this one is zero, right? So there's some changing in notation here, but this one, uh, J equals zero is that guy. And everybody else is somewhere else away from that. Now, we're thinking, hey, wait a second. If we do that, one of the things that we have at this point is we have a correspondence between the image. Remember, we're always going back to the image because that's what we're getting from our video camera. We have an image and the training data. We know where this thing actually lives in 3D space according to that image. But if I start screwing around with this, then where am I getting the images for when I scooted this guy up? Oh, actually, we don't need to. What we can do is basically figure out the transform that gets that guy out. And if we want to figure out the pixels that go with that, we don't actually have to create a new image. In fact, that would be a little bit difficult. What we, we can do is invert that transform. So I have, with each one of these guys, we record a transformation matrix, M sub J uh, alpha, or A. I don't know why there's an A there. Um, we simply record the transformation matrix M A J that maps S I sub J back to the original shape S I sub zero, which together with the, the camera's projection matrix provides enough information to retrieve the appearance data of the image that corresponds to the shape. So remember, this shape is just however many points, 60 points on this guy's face, right? We've got the outline of the mouth, and there, there's our mask. And blah, 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 blah. We don't actually need a full image for this. We just need to know, if I looked up the pixel for that point, what color is it? Well, I can figure that out by just sort of saying, okay, how do I get back to the original one? Plop that value back into there. It's easy, actually. All right? So far, so good. Maybe that's because, well, we'll see. Oh, my God. All right. Now, included with this set is the original shape, which we lived in the data augmentation. This data augment augmentation process expands the original data to n times m. Right? So now instead of n images, which is 80, we now have n times m, or n is the number of that, and M is the number of poses that we put it in space. That's the number of training images, virtual images that we have, score. To each of the augmented image shape data, we assign various initial shape estimates to obtain the training set for regression algorithm. What? All right, so now we're going to be doing, um, since the initial shape estimates for a video frame run it, at runtime will be determined based on the face shape of the preceding frame, we choose the initial shape for the training set construction, considered both locally and random, uh, considering both locality and randomness. So 
wait, what? The whole idea is here, if we've got, so remember we have a whole bunch of expressions, we have a whole bunch of poses, and now we have them sort of scattered throughout space. Just like in the previous paper, we're going to use the previous frame as our starting point. So for this, we also need to have an idea of the starting point for getting to where we currently are in here. So we, for each one of these image shape pairs, we're going to find the D most similar shapes from our original N shapes. So what we're going to do is go through this thing and look for shapes that are very similar to this. And, and yes, no, that's, that's fine. And we go through here and we actually get a whole bunch of starting points that get us to S sub I J. So what we're going to produce is a bunch of initial shapes that are close to this. Basically, we're going to look for this something that says, if my head is at this location in this expression, I want to find a list of faces that are close to that in this space and close to that in that expression. So we're going to look for something that we could assume this starts from. So there's going to be a whole bunch of S, what do they call this guy? This is the, the subscripting on this gets really confusing. S sub I J, oh wait, G. J H. This is absolutely crazy. And that is an H. So that subscript has an actual subscript. So for each image shape pair, we first find the G most similar shapes from the original N shapes. So we look for shapes that are close by. And then randomly choose H shapes from among those additional shapes generated from each S sub I G in the data set augmentation step. This yields G times H initial shapes for this guy. So there are G times H initial shapes that could eventually get to our current shape that we're at. So eventually, we have this many training images, or uh, image shape pairs. Oh, the cool thing is, those are multipliers. So we start out with 80, we add an um, extra blob here, and then we have this, this randomly chosen kind of thing, and we end up with this good, enormous set of training shapes, even though we only have 80 shapes to begin with. Which is basically saying, you know, our training shapes are going to be the space of where the face can move from and get to. And the way we compare images, like what's close to this, is it's just a, a, a quick, you center the two guys and then you subtract the, the vertices. So you can, um, uh, you're just looking at how far away the vectors are. Okay, phone rang. Do you want, I wanted to get a little bit further. It was wild explain. Okay, we're gonna skip camera calibration, but screw it. <laughs> okay, so now we have N, where N is M, uh, lowercase n times M times G times uh, H, training data. And so this, this is this great big set of pair, uh, uh, quadruples of uh, original image. Um, the transform that gets uh, our current face shape into that spot then S sub I, um, and that's that's the shape that we're currently on, and then they say S sub I C, that's the starting shape. So this is this is the shape that we're at. This is where we came from. All right, now that is a lot of data. Remember this. If we took away this, there would only be 80 pairs of I, these guys. But because we added this, there's a lot more of these guys. And then because we had this starting, starting from this position, we have a whole bunch more of these guys. So there's a lot of different variations in here. Now we do that regression thing. So 
Um, I'm giving one to R2 to all the way to Rm. Remember that booster regression kind of thing? That all started from a 2D representation of a face's shape. Now we have a 3D representation of a face's shape. But at its core, it works out exactly the same thing. We have a place that we're starting from, a place that, we want to, that we're currently at, that is currently labeled, and we want to find something. We'll take this and turn it into that. So far, so good. And so the way we're going to do that is go right back to the pixel differences. Because we have a way of any shape inside here going through there and figuring out the pixel, different, uh, the pixel differences for that current transformation. So we're going to do exactly that kind of thing. We're going to choose a whole bunch of random points in the image, figure out which pair of points correlates the best to a small nudge to our regression, and this actually works. And I'm waving my hands like crazy. But this T at the end of it, that is equal to 10, just like the original paper. This actually goes to K, not M, is equal to uh, 300. The number of points that we sample is 400 random points in pixels. And uh, there's a, a, a beta algorithm thing that uh, I'm not even going to talk about. So this is the size of our regression tree. And this is uh, kind of gives you an idea of how long it would take to train this. So it probably doesn't take that long to train this, but it does take some, a certain amount of time because all these guys are multiplying. It's 10 times 300. And, and you have to do it over and over again. And also there's a, this actually gets squared. P squared happens inside here. So that number gets actually quite large. Okay. So. Uh, assume that works. <laughs> um, so. Indeed, I've got two seconds, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this. But at the end of all this, I'm just trying to remember and uh, think about, you know, I'm, I'm going to allow, exercise the reader, go back to the paper and look at the algorithm for this. But in, in the paper, that's it's listed out as algorithm number one. And it describes the pseudocode for doing this. And you have to spend a little bit of time with the pseudocode. Each individual step does not look hard at all. But why they're doing each individual step is actually a little bit of a trick. But it's easy to write. Once you have all this stuff set up, once you have this, writing algorithm one is doing a lot of pixel differences, right? You're either doing the vector uh, dot products or you're doing pixel differences. And it's actually pretty easy to write. To do it fast, you probably want to throw the GPU at it and all sorts of stuff, but we're going to run it just for a moment. But it, it actually does work. At the end of all this, what do we have? We have this thing, this black box, that given an image from a web camera, we've got our web camera and we have me looking dorky at, at the screen, I will put out not a 2D, but a 3D shape that represents the 3D location of the landmarks on my face, the 75 landmarks that I have found on my face. The next step is to figure out the blend shapes for my expression. Because this thing, notice, doesn't have blend shapes. It just has 3D shapes, and we're going to be nudging those like crazy. So the next thing to do is to solve for that. But then, like I said at the beginning, it's not hard because we have a one-to-one -one mapping between the landmarks and the blend shapes in our thing. We know the, the thing. So this becomes just a solve for the alphas that make the face that I've detected on you. And that's all I'm going to say about that because this paper is way too long. So, you know, this, this is like three papers. They should have been written once just one paper. We have to go. Next week will be something totally different because I went to a GPU technology conference. We're going to talk about, I don't know, <laughs> something else.